Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. I, and uh, oh, sorry, we have. Uh, I'm going to try to say a main, a few main things in the 10, 12 minutes I have. Uh, first of all, let me say what many people have already said: that this is a path-breaking work. Piketty's work is. Uh, 15 years of dedicated labor, and that is uh, a risk that anyone who's engaged in long labor knows. You don't know how it's going to turn out. It's a sign of his courage and his ability to maintain that. And with the work of uh, Anthony Atkinson and Emmanuel Saez, their writings and data have already uh, changed the way that we look at income inequality uh, socially and over time. And the fact that they've made their data available in top income database is also very important. It parallels the work of Angus Madison, for instance, who made his data available. But I assure you this is not the tradition in economics. Uh, I've written to people in the World Bank and asked for their data only to be told the answer is no. So uh, the, Piketty's work represents a tradition in economics in which theory is derived from the study of actual economies. Now this seems like an obvious point, but the fact is that this is not what the majority of the tradition, uh, majority of the profession does. Uh, his goal is to identify structural properties of capitalism, to un try to understand what causes them, and then try to draw some implications for that. But as he himself points out, this is not what orthodox economics does, what uh, I'm going to call neoclassical economics, so it's really anti-classical economics. Because there, it has been preoccupied from the very beginning with the analysis of a fictitious world uh, of perfect competition, perfect consumers, perfect firms, and perfect markets. And uh, that, to students and to st people who study the profession, comes as a shock because you keep waiting for the moment when the reality will come in. But it comes in only as an exception and only as an irritation in the pearl uh, in, the, in the oyster of orthodox economics. Uh, there is, however, an older tradition, and I want to emphasize that this has always been there. It's not as if it needs to be reinvented, but it certainly needs to be rediscovered. That includes Smith and Ricardo and Marx and Keynes and Kaletsky and many others who have worked in the tradition, and obviously Piketty and Atkinson and Sayers and others are in that tradition, institutional economics, uh, at the New School, we have always been in that older and more grounded tradition. And from the time of our founders, Wesley Clare Mitchell, whose work on business cycle was just as founding as, as Piketty's work is on inequality. Thorsten Veblen, who one has to read to realize how absolutely relevant his ideas were. And e eminent economics faculty such as Adolf Lowe, Robert Halberner, David Gordon, Lance Taylor, and Duncan Foley. Indeed, as chair of the economics department, I am most pleased to announce that Lance Taylor and Duncan Foley have just been awarded the 2015 Leontief Prize for the Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought from the Global Development and Environmental Institute of Tufts University. So we congratulate Lance and Duncan. So when we in this vein, I beg you not to use the word e economist to refer to everybody. There's more than one type of economist, and indeed there's more than one tradition in economics. Piketty rightly comments on the orthodoxy's childish passion for mathematics in purely theoretical and highly ideological speculation at the expense of historical research, which he says disposes the profession to churn out purely theoretical results without even knowing what the facts that are Need, needed to be explained. And we've seen an example in his presentation of exactly facts that needed to be explained. Now, Piketty is, of course, an eminent uh, uh, authority to say this, but there's an even more eminent authority that's saying this now. And that's a recent editorial in the Financial Times, September 25th, 2014. I have to read this because I never thought I would live to hear the Financial Times say this. The typical economics course starts with the study of how rational agents interact in frictionless markets producing an outcome that is best for everyone. Only later does it cover those wrinkles and perversities that characterize real economic behavior, such as anti-competitive practices or unstable financial markets. 
As students advance, there's a growing bias towards mathematical elegance. When the uglier real world intrudes, it only prompts the question, this is all very well in practice, but how does it work in theory? <laughs> the Financial Times goes on to make a prescription, which I find really uh, amazing. The steps needed to bring economics teaching into the real world do not require the invention of anything new or exotic. The curriculum should embrace economic history and pay more attention to unorthodox thinkers such as jo Joseph Schumpeter, Frederick Hayek, and yes, even Karl Marx. <laughs> so I thank the philo uh, Financial Times. Um, this is precisely what many heterodox economists have been doing for a long time, and as I said, this is what we do at the New School, have done from the very beginning. I want to turn now to the structure of Piketty's book. The book has three logical parts, which is different from the physical division that he has. The presentation of the empirical findings on the distribution of income and wealth, and a central claim here is that capitalism tends to produce increasing inequality and that various shocks and social forces have acted to reduce this tendency. And these include world wars, revolutions, and depressions, and I'm going to try to illustrate a particular social event, which was the neoliberal era of the 1980s. The second logical part is the argument that there is a causal structure linking these different patterns. And this he didn't have time to get into there, but the book, uh, which has 700 pages of space, has uh, much more room for that causal argument. And that's indeed what I want to try to focus on here. He relies quite a bit on orthodox economic theory, but also rejects it when it comes to uh, its inability to look at the empirical evidence, such as the argument, for instance, that wages are determined by the marginal productivity of labor. The third logical part, which I think Heather will focus more on, is the policy implications. But I do want to try to say a little bit about that at the end. So with this, I'm going to try to focus on two key elements of his argument which have to do with the distribution of incomes. He himself focuses on what I want to call the achieved final distribution of incomes. Labor income includes wages, salaries, unemployment benefits and transfers, bonuses and stock options. Property income includes uh, income from uh, what he calls income from capital, includes rent, interest, profits, capital gains, royalties and other incomes from the ownership of land including, and real estate and financial instruments. Now this is absolutely the right uh, division because he's looking at the actual distribution of income and people get income from all these different sources. But from a classical tradition, in fact from almost all, every economic tradition, these different sources are not the same in terms of their determination. Uh, you can easily find in almost any economic tradition the argument that they are primary revenues, which I'm going to call wages and operating surplus. Operating surplus is a term in national income counts, which is the excess of uh, nat national income over wages. Then there's a secondary revenues, which come from the distribution of wages into taxes and, and disposable income and the distribution of operating surplus into rents, interest, royalties, and taxes. Different things intervene at this level from those that determine the first level. And then there's a third level, a tertiary distribution, which consists of state payments, of unemployment insurance, and transfer payments to labor and of subsidies to capital. And from Piketty's definition of capital is that which encompasses all of these and the definition of labor income, all of the labor incomes, and that's perfectly appropriate, but I want to argue that we can build up to that and you get a different picture if you do that. So this leads me to two central questions on the primary revenues. What determines the distribution of wage incomes and property incomes, or wage incomes and the gross surplus? And then what determines, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. What determines the distribution within wage incomes and the within property incomes? And then what determines the primary division between wages and surplus? That is the classical question beginning with Smith and every economic tradition has an answer to that. On the first question, on the distribution of primary labor and property incomes. It's interesting to note that the original hypothesis on the distribution of property income came from another French, famous French economist and engineer by the name of Vilfredo Pareto. Uh, 
who discovered in the course of his empirical investigations that property income seems to follow a particular probability distribution that we call the power law and that we now call a Pareto distribution. For a while it was, and Pareto himself seemed to believe this was true of all income, but it was rapidly discovered that it did not hold for labor income. Very recently, the, ph the physicist Viktor Yakovenko and his co-author have argued on theoretical grounds that labor income follows one law, which he calls an exponential distribution, and property incomes follow another law, the distribution of property incomes, which is the Pareto law. What uh, Yakovenko and his co-author show is that the link between the two, which determines the overall distribution of income, depends on one variable alone, and that variable is the share of property income to uh, uh, total income, in other words, Piketty's alpha. And I think people haven't noticed that these two uh, theoretical arguments come together. So I want to show first um, this data, which is a part of the hypothesis of Yakovenko and his co-authors. We're looking at the income of uh, people from IRS data below 100,000 because uh, Yakovenko argues that it's only above that that the property income becomes significant. So below that is mostly labor income. And what he argues is that when you plot this on a particular scale, this is a cumulative probability distribution from above and the bottom are the bins uh, from the IRS. The straight line is not a fitted line, it's the theoretical line for an exponential distribution. And the data itself fits that very well. And uh, this work has been duplicated in different countries and this says that it gives us a handle on what determines the distribution of, of labor income. In recent work with Noe Wiener, Nicholas Papaniklo, and I have looked at labor incomes from another database, which is a CPS, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Current Population Survey, and there we could actually look at labor income, and we could see that this pattern actually holds, not just because it's below 100,000, because we actually can separate labor income from other types of income. Uh, we find even more remarkably that the distribution within race and gender categories is also uh, uh, exponential. And this is something people haven't really asked. We know that distribution by race and gender, averages by race and gender, depend on all kinds of social factors, including discrimination. But no one has really paid much attention to the hypothesis that there is a law, so to speak, uh, within the categories. Now, uh, one of the things about the exponential distribution of income is that it has this very lovely property, lovely if you like such things, is that the Gini coefficient is 0.5, regardless. So what Yakovenko and all show that this is the case for labor incomes in every year. But then how do you make that fit uh, Piketty's data where he says that the Gini coefficient is much lower, it's 0.2 to 0.4 in different countries. And the answer is precisely what I'm trying to argue, that the basic distribution of labor incomes created by the market, which is wage incomes, prior to taxes and prior to transfers, has a very strong structural property, which is that it's exponential. But when you add on transfers, most of these transfers are designed to help people at the bottom end. So of course, they make the distribution of income less. And so to do it properly, I believe that one should move in those stages. Let me now move to the second thing, which is the division between wages and operating surplus. This is the uh, argument, uh, this is the central point of concern of everybody from Adam Smith onward. And uh, I want to make the argument in a particular way based on an old one by uh, uh, William Phillips. Phillips looked at the rate of change of money wages and showed that they were inversely related to the unemployment rate. But we know that that argument fell apart in the 70s. From a classical point of view, what you want to look at is not the money wage, but the ratio of the wage to value added because it's the distribution which is the key to labor struggles. As anyone who studied labor economics knows, you're talking about the possibility which is value added and the share which is wages. And the balance of power between workers and their employers plays a very crucial role. So what I'm going to look at is the rate of change of real wages, of the wage share on the vertical axis and unemployment intensity, which is the unemployment rate adjusted for the duration of unemployment, which is shot up very much in, in uh, so this, 
if it works. On the vertical axis, the rate of change of the wage share. On the horizontal axis, unemployment intensity. And we begin in 1949. Oops. Well, we don't. Oh, yeah, there. 1949, 1950, so on. And this is the actual path of the U.S. economy. 1960, and then comes the great pumping of the economy due to the Vietnam War. And you go back up that curve. And the Vietnam War boom uh, in stimulus runs out, and you come back down. And you keep going, and 1977 marks a kind of watershed. You cross the zero line. And now you enter the new liberal era, which played such a big role in Piketty's work, 1980s onward. This is the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, which is an attack on labor and labor-supporting institutions, as well as a reduction in tax rates for the top incomes and an increase in the profit share. And look what happens. The curve breaks apart. 1993, you have the dot-com bubble, so you pump up. The bubble runs out, so you pump down. And now, this is where we are. Whoops, I went too fast. <laughs> I'll do that. Anyway, so the point of this curve is that it allows us to have a foundation for Piketty's variable that he calls alpha. Alpha is the ratio of labor incomes to value added, but it includes all the transfers. But the base of the labor incomes is the division of value added between wages and gross operating surplus. And that, as we know from history, involves struggle, social struggle and uh, uh, struggle at the floor of the uh, uh, businesses. So with this, um, it's possible to make a similar argument for the other side, but I'm out of time, so let me just say, go back to what I said in the beginning. The great virtue of this work is that it's based on a wealth of data, a wealth of data on wealth and income, and in which uh, Thomas and his co-authors have made available to all. The patterns in the data require explanation, and here, in explanation, you inevitably have to turn to theory. It is entirely possible to ground these in more than one theory, as he himself says, and theory in turn influences policy implications. Piketty's long-term patterns lead him to consider structural explanations, which he correctly argues cannot be derived from orthodox economics. I want to argue that the kind of uh, presentation I made, which is based on classical economics, is in fact a structural explanation. Structural in the sense that it speaks about the structure of the economy and the structure of the social balance of forces, which is so essential. This allows us to then build up from there to the particular influence of taxes, transfers, subsidies, and the changing structure of institutions, including the state. The neoliberal era plays a very important role because we know that it wasn't just a shock. It was planned. It was a, a, to weaken labor, to reduce the interest rates so financial assets jump up, and that shows up in the capital value of those assets, and to reduce tax rates. It follows, therefore, that since it was planned, and since it was a social construction, it can be socially deconstructed. Thank you. Professor Piketty, while my colleagues are collecting um, questions from the audience, and I will moderate those, would you like to respond to, to Heather and Anwar? OK, great. You can just do it from the table uh, there? Yeah. Sure. No, just, you know, I, I think it's better if we have more time for questions, but let, let me just say very quickly that I, I think uh, what Isser said about uh, the importance of uh, gender equality and women participation is extremely uh, important. You know, I, I think, the, you know, in some countries, uh, it's clear that, the, you know, the, the pressure that's put on women to uh, to to basically, uh, you know, withdraw from the labor force after they have uh, children as a consequence that, uh, you know, some countries are almost about to disappear. You know, when you have the, uh, you know, when, they, when, when the size of the court uh, in, in Japan or Korea or Germany or Italy, that the, the size of the generations that are born right now are 30% smaller than the generation of their parents. You know, this is not the complete uh, end of the country, but this is getting close. You know, if you continue like this for two or three generations, and so, you know, like all important social and economic issues, this is not a technical issue. This is really a conflict of what part of society is asking to women and, and what 
as they actually don't want to deliver. And so the solution will, will come from, uh, uh, you know, more gender equality and from policies that uh, help uh, uh, mothers and fathers uh, to, uh, you know, have the children they want to have and have the, the daycare system and the, the institution in society that allows them to reconcile their uh, professional aspiration and their, uh, their educational uh, role. So this is extremely important. I think these demographic issues are some of the deepest uh, you know, issue and challenge we have to face. And they have strong consequences also on inequality because a society where you have uh, a declining population is also a society where inherited wealth and inheritance becomes very important. And uh, you know, if you want to reduce inequality and make inheritance uh, less important, you should have a lot of children, basically. So, so, so that's... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I get to do this. This is fun. Um, wait a second. Yeah, how about this? Um, and this would be to any of the panelists. Maybe, Heather, you have um, some insight, but to you, um, Professor Piketty. Is there any information, anything that you came across that would um, give you an idea about what point inequality would foment social unrest and maybe lead to a transformation, maybe lead to to, um, to progressive taxation. Um, what's that level? And if you haven't found such a relationship, why not? There, I, Professor Piketty first. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm afraid I don't have a mathematical uh, formula to determine this level, but, uh, you know, what I try to do in the, in the book is to show that at least we can make progress uh, by, you know, historical comparison and try to better understand the orders of magnitude where, where inequality becomes really uh, excessive. So, for instance, you know, the, the, the level of wealth concentration that we find in uh, European countries uh, uh, until World War I was, I think, excessive in at least two ways. You know, first, it was not useful for growth. Clearly, uh, 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 inequality was greatly reduced by uh, uh, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, by a number of social policies that were enacted after the wars. And, and this did not reduce growth. If anything, mm -hmm. this contributed to yeah. even higher growth in post-war decade. And, and also, this very high level of inequality, I think, contributed to the inability of uh, democratic uh, European societies where in, pr in principle, you know, you had universal suffrage, uh, at least for men uh, in 1910, 1914, but, the, you know, I think largely the political power was captured by, uh, by uh, wealthy uh, elites and this explained part of the reason why the, the political system was not responding to the very high inequality and very high social tension yeah. of the time. Uh, you know, in, in France, uh, income tax was adopted not to pay for schools, but to pay for the war in the summer of 1914, you know, just one century ago. And this was the only time when the French uh, Republican uh, elite accepted to. So, so it's a very sad story where I think the, the, the high inequality went with, uh, with the capture of the political process that prevented the right uh, social reform and fiscal reform from happening. And this is something that, you know, we don't want to return to that kind of situation and there is growing concern, in particular in this country, that, uh, you know, when inequality uh, is getting as high as it does today, it, it, it has, you know, this is a real threat for our democratic institution and, and uh, the, ab the ability of the, of the democratic system to respond to yeah. uh, the, the, this, uh, this challenge that we have to, to respond. So, yeah, I think history can tell, uh, you know, can help us to realize when this is getting yeah, uh, out of uh, too high. Well, let me just add one thing, which is, um, uh, I'm sure that you would not say this, Piketty, but Thomas Piketty, but uh, it was your work with Emmanuel Saez that um, we saw in banners all over um, the United States in the Occupy Wall Street movement about the, the we are the 1% and the 99% the numbers. Uh, it, for me, watching that happen and realizing the first time I saw that, I was like, where have I seen that before? And realizing it was from a quarterly Journal of Economics paper and wondering like how that had sort of made its way to some crazy activist which was very interesting to see. I mean, I think that 
um, I mean, I think the question is interesting, Teresa, but it's also, uh, I think, underscores the importance of data that mm -hmm. um, helps encapsulate what the, the real world experiences people are um, having out there that, that is the role of, a, of us as economists to be finding. But it's amazing, to, though, to then see actual activist groups pick that up and run with it and do with it what they will. But um, I will just sort of note that, that this work has already sort of sparked some social movements here. Um, mm -hmm. Let me add a couple of points here. We've been talking mostly about the developed world, but there is a huge level of inequality across the uh, developing world. And one of the astonishing things is that it's tolerated for long periods of time. And that what breaks it up is not so much that, but the joining of that with the issue of employment. If jobs are not there, then it uh, becomes much more volatile. And of course, the political structure. I was once taken on a tour in China of a museum in which they would go from one dynasty to another, and I noticed that there were breaks in the time between dynasties, and they were not mentioned in there. So I asked my guide, what is that? He said, oh, the peasants overthrew the dynasty and killed everybody, and then a couple hundred years later. So there's your answer. We need more peasants of that sort. <laughs> Um, he, here's a question about the form of tax. Um, would a tax on land um, or rent control um, or a tax on a carbon, would that have the same effect as uh, a progressive income tax of 90% marginal tax rate? Uh, no. No, these are, these are all different taxes. They can all be useful. They are all complementary. You know, a carbon tax is, of course, has a very specific purpose, which is to reduce carbon emission. Yeah. And ideally, uh, if the carbon tax works, you know, there will be no tax revenue anymore or very little tax yeah, revenue. So, right, so that's right. not, uh, you know, the, the, that's, this has a very, very specific purpose. Uh, and so I think we need both, you know, that kind of uh, carbon tax. We need both uh, a progressive income tax and a progressive wealth tax. You know, this is serving different purposes. The land tax, you know, that's part, in my view, this should be part of, uh, of a wealth tax. Yeah. So land is part of wealth, but, you know, if you want to isolate land from other forms of wealth, I think this doesn't work because, uh, uh, you know, the land value from the building value, so in some cases, like this place, maybe you can separate. The, the, the land component, although you know the, the land, even the land component here depends a lot of, of the other investment and improvement that have been made to the surroundings yeah, and right. that make New York City uh, New York City. So, so, so it's difficult. You know, the pure land value. It's a social construction. The price of land depends on a whole set of social right. institutions, and, and also you mm -hmm. can own land and, and real estate through a financial company, through financial assets. So, if you don't have comprehensive uh, wealth tax, uh, you know, some people are going to escape the tax by owning land and real estate through financial assets. So, you know, the, the only reason why the, the, the current wealth tax in the U.S. is the property tax. So it, it taxes real estate and, and land. The only reason why it doesn't tax financial assets is because this was created uh, two centuries ago at a time where financial assets were not important. Uh, so, uh, you know, the issue is to, is, to, um, is to transform our tax system uh, to adapt it to the structure of wealth today. And I think it will, uh, you know, the, the, the simplest solution will be to replace the existing property tax by a progressive tax on net wealth. So that, in effect, the vast majority of the population will pay less tax. So all the people who have... A, large mortgage and we are trying to enter the game and we are trying to accumulate wealth will pay less tax, it will increase wealth mobility and people with very large uh, financial wealth will, will, pay, uh, will pay more tax and you know I think it, we will come to that one day, you know this will mm -hmm. take time but you know I think this is, uh, this, this is common sense at some level. Um, well let's advance the vision of uh, what, that's in your book, the very optimistic part of your book and that's all th three of you talk about the pathway between a progressive wealth tax, that would mean most of us would pay less tax, um, and of social mobility. What's the linkage between that, that revenue gain and um, your hope for an innovative, mobile society? For, first you, Professor. Well, the, the link, the first link is that if you know if you reduce uh, uh, the tax that's paid by the 
bottom groups in society and, oh. and for that matter the bottom 90 percent you know it makes it easier to to accumulate uh, uh, wealth the, the the link is also that if you reduce top managerial compensation you know this will help to increase uh, other wages so i mm -hmm. think you know a big part of the wage gains have been appropriated by the top and you know you could have ah. bigger increase in in wages for mm -hmm. uh, middle groups and bottom groups mm -hmm. if you were to uh, limit Uh, top managerial compensation by higher uh, tax rate at the very top and together with increase in the federal minimum wage. You know, the, fe you know, the federal minimum wage right now uh, has, a, has a purchasing power uh, that is uh, uh, less than what it was uh, in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, 50 years ago. And, you know, it's quite unusual uh, for a country to have a uh, You know, decline in the purchasing power of its minimum wage uh, in uh, in uh, over half a century, and also we you know, stand uh, apart from that, right? In your book shows that. Well, yeah, it's yeah. it's very uh, it's very striking, and and yeah. so you know, I think it's possible to increase it quite substantially mm -hmm. without increasing unemployment. You know, unemployment was not higher in the 60s, although the uh, no, uh, you know uh, the real value of the minimum wage was higher than it is now. So uh, now, in the in the long run, of course. It's easier to have a higher minimum wage if you have also higher investment in education, higher investment in skills, so that you know bottom uh, workers can have access to higher productivity jobs and higher. So it's all complementary, you know. Okay. Be, you know, progressive taxation, higher minimum wage, and higher public okay. investment in education. You know, I think are the three, uh, uh, you know, yeah. key policies that need okay. to go together. We don't want to choose; they are complementary. Um, Heather, do you agree those are the key policies? Certainly. I think I want to emphasize one thing that that um, has been said that I think is really important, that it's, you know, so often we think about inequality and we think about um, both the taxes and the and the revenue and what we're going to do about it. So often we think about, well, here's the things, the policies that we're going to do for people and how much they cost, and that's really where all the action is. But I think... Um, this conversation really pushes us to to say, oh, well, actually, it's not, you're not just You're not just taxing folks at the top in a progressive way to punish them, but, mm -hmm. but the, that a progressive tax system is actually more functional in many ways for the economy. And I think yeah. that's a really important thing to keep bearing in mind. If these um, very high incomes that folks at the top are earning are not indeed productive, but are some form of rent or um, extraction, or they're coming at the mm -hmm. expense of middle income workers getting higher wages, which then is, is correlated with what's going on in terms of stable consumption patterns or has an effect on what kinds of investments they can make in the next generation, that there's cost to all of that. Um, I think 15 or uh, 20 years ago, it, there was a conception that it's okay, you know, inequality is just fine, we don't really need to deal with it in terms of policy because just because somebody's getting rich doesn't mean that somebody's actually losing, mm -hmm. the pie just keeps getting bigger. Mm -hmm. But even if the pie is getting a little bit bigger, um, addressing the, how this skew is uh, not focusing our Our, our, to use the nation state, our nation's economic resources on uh, activities that would further economic productivity and economic stability, if you sort of think about the Great Recession um, being driven by the, uh, the way that uh, families took on too much debt and how that was concentrated among low net worth households, one could only imagine if, they, if households were getting the kinds of wage gains that we would like them to yeah. be getting because you'd been doing something where you were taxing more at the top and they were um, using mm -hmm. that money instead mm -hmm. to give each other higher wages. They were actually just paying people more and so you had wages more aligned with That's productivity weird. that that would have had an effect on um, mm -hmm. how much people might have been borrowing. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But I think connecting those dots is really important so thinking about the policy not just in terms of the punishment or what that particular tax revenue might buy us but how that affects um, the how our economy functions um, I wanted to add a, a, a voice on that because I agree with Heather that the key issue is that we have to not just talk about the distribution but at the sec what I call the secondary level which is the taxes and so on but at the primary level mm -hmm. and that's very important If you look in the history of taxes on land, Henry George argued very, very uh, persuasively that tax unused land should be taxed, and his views became extremely influential across the United States, where he was, and Europe, and it became the basis of a land tax, which forced many people holding large estates to disgorge them. We know now all kinds of poor counts and dukes in, in Europe who uh, have to work for a living. And this, it did... Happen? 
No, <laughs> from their point of view it is, and that's a very important issue. This led, as Thomas points out, to other forms of assets and wealth, yeah. and we are now focusing on the generality of assets and wealth, but the fact is that the underlying distribution has a lot to do with uh, the, the extent of inequality, and that's something that we have to put up front, the distribution by class, by gender, by race, ethnicity, in most parts of the world, these are bite much harder than the question of taxation and transfers. Yeah. We don't all live in Sweden, and that's an important thing to understand. Oh, it's a fascinating counterintuitive finding that raising taxes would actually raise the wages of people um, in the middle class. And then also that's coupled with a direct policy that's aligned with the rest of Europe to raise the minimum wage, that you actually have a pathway between progressive income taxes and raising the wages for most people, which Heather points out actually may have reduced some of the indebtedness and therefore stabilized the financial crisis. A, a fascinating connections. Um, we have questions, a couple of questions here, and you mentioned it a bit in your, in your book, which is tying the, um, the growth of inequality um, to the increasing constraint of, on the planet uh, for economic growth. Can you actually draw a, a arrows between um, curbing the inequality of wealth and income and actually creating a sustainable planet? Right. So, I, you know, in, in the last chapter of the book, I, I try to explain that the, the you know, these, these issues about uh, financial transparency, uh, public debt, you know, may seem very difficult to, to solve, but in fact they are very simple problems to solve as compared to the real problems of, uh, you know, global warming and threat to our natural capital, which, you know, we should be much more concerned <coughs> about because, uh, you know, the public debt, uh, after all, it is just a debt against ourselves. It is just, you know, this can yeah. be changed. We just have to change what's written in the book and, you know, it will, there's nothing. Uh, and there are lots of experience in the past where we had public debt even bigger than that, you know, 200% of GDP uh, in 1945 in France and Germany. And in 1950, it was zero because we had decided that it would be zero. And so there was inflation, there was debt repudiation. And of course, this did not prevent uh, future economic growth, quite the opposite. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's, uh, whereas when you have uh, three more degrees on the planet, uh, you know, that's more difficult to, uh, yeah. to get rid of it just, uh, just through inflation, you know. So, yeah. so, uh, so we should, you know, the, the worst thing about the uh, inequality and, and, and problem and financial opacity problem is that this, this makes it more difficult for, this takes all our energy and this makes it more difficult to solve the other problem. So I think it's important, you know, that we make progress uh, both on the inequality front so that we can also uh, move to the more important uh, front which is uh, you know the environment and the you know the long run sustainability uh, of growth it's very difficult to ask uh, normal people to make effort uh, on the environment you know by paying more uh, tax and, and uh, you know carbon tax or uh, oil tax etc if people have the feeling that you know the high wealth uh, people large multinationals are not paying yeah. uh, tax at all. So, so it's very, uh, you know, these problems in order to be solved need more uh, financial transparency, need more uh, democratic transparency about income and wealth. And, uh, you know, as, as, um, as we were saying earlier, that's even more true in uh, uh, poorer countries, in emerging countries uh, than, uh, than in rich countries where a lot of the wealth is often, uh, you know, uh, exiting the country uh, because of the lack of financial cooperation uh, to fight tax havens and to to get uh, to a more transparent uh, international tax system. Now, the, you know, the good news is that I think we can make progress. You know, I think if we put the right sanctions on tax havens, you know, we are about uh, to have a big negotiation uh, between uh, the United States and the European Union for a new uh, trade uh, treaty. I think it will be a mistake 
to have only a trade liberalization into this treaty. You know, we are putting half of the world GDP around the table, you know, about one quarter of world GDP for the US, about one quarter for yeah. the European Union. So you know, this is not a global government, but this is still half of the world GDP. And this is a unique opportunity to try to bring more uh, fiscal justice into globalization with a minimal tax on multinational corporations, um, a global registry of financial assets, and you know, if we don't put a strong fiscal, social, environmental regulation into such an agreement, uh, I think there's a strong probability that our public opinion, yeah. both in the US and in Europe, will not be happy with just another round of trade yeah. liberalization. So, you know, we have to take these opportunities to make, uh, to make progress. Yeah. So if I could add something to that, I mean, I think um, on your question about the, the climate change and uh, and where we are in terms of politics, uh, it made me think about how we have a lot of evidence here in the United States that today's high income inequality is associated with um, political outcomes that favor those who have most of the money. Um, and I think that, you know, it's something we don't think about enough with climate change, but there's some research, and I'm... I apologize to whoever the author is because I'm just blanking on the name. I don't, it just, just wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it before I, uh, but at any rate, showing that um, if a policy is not favored by the wealthy, it doesn't get yeah. put into action. So it could be that, you know, that policies that, so they're just clapping for that. That's not a good thing, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, maybe point. that was a like on Facebook, you yeah. know, when you actually don't like it, but all right. Um, I digress. But, um, but I think that, you know, when we think about climate change and who is impacted, we know that the effects um, are, are disproportionately felt by low-income families and in certain communities. I mean, there was an article in today's paper about uh, people in, in a community in California living in, um, yeah. who own their land but live in mobile homes who don't have any water. Well, and you're yeah. reading this, I mean, this is a climate change story, but they have no options. They can't sell their land and nobody's going to help them. Um, and so you're seeing these effects that are being sort of concentrated among people all also have the least political power. So while climate change affects us all, those at the very top have ways of uh, mitigating that to a little bit to their own benefit and may not feel the same exact measure of urgency. Certainly we're seeing that play itself out through our politics. But I do think it's important to understand, I don't know if other questions want to focus on the intersection between today's high income inequality in the United States and how that is playing itself out and what evidence we have on that. Right. right. Yeah, I, I want to add that uh, Really, when we talk about the benefits of the economy as a whole, we're really telling a lie because, of course, some people win and some people lose. I mean, you're not going to persuade the Koch brothers uh, that higher wages and uh, higher taxes on, on profit because they know perfectly well that that's not in their interest. So if we want to talk about democracy and democratic capitalism, we have to understand that it is a system of conflict wrapped in com compromise. And the compromise has to come about by recognizing that some losses are socially justified, even though they are losses, and we can't speak of them as just as gains. That becomes even more important when you go outside of the developed world, where you're talking about very serious transfers involved if we're going to talk about any serious development. So I'm all in favor of arguing that it's good for the majority of the people, which is an older phrase, uh, than for the economy as a whole. Um, well, I, I do agree that your book, um, Professor Piketty, and all of us who have worked on inequality and wealth and income have really um, fueled the momentum to these tax uh, regime um, <coughs> conversations. And um, Apple plaintively saying, I didn't break the law when I moved to Ireland and didn't. I mean, we are, they're on the defensive, and I think we can take credit for that. And also, the numbers that you and um, Saez developed for the United States became placards and T-shirts, you know, in the Occupy um, um, movement. So that's that's very optimistic. That numbers matter um, in terms of people's uh, imagination. Um, I would like to turn to what Anwar just talked about, and that conflict and change is uh, that change comes from conflict, maybe fueled by data, but the conflict has to be there. And you said in an interview that if you had to redo the book again, and maybe imagine the conversations you've had, that you would have talked more about labor unions and how their rise and fall has affected your graphs that rise and fall. Would you like to take the moment here and expand upon that? <laughs> 
Yes, no, it's, I, I, you know, I guess it played a more important role in my mind than in my writing. In my writing, you know, I, I do talk about, uh, about the, the labor movement, but probably I, I do not, uh, you know, given the length of the book, you yeah. know, I, I, you know I, I should have emphasized more that, uh, you know, this was, of course, part of the, of the new uh, institutional setup that made the post-war uh, period uh, possible and you know it's very uh, uh, you know and more generally you know the, the labor movement uh, and the, the, the pressure that was brought also by the uh, existence of a counter model with uh, with the communist model you know put a strong pressure uh, on uh, on uh, you know capital owners in uh, in uh, in western countries which completely change uh, the the attitudes toward a number of social and fiscal reforms that were previously uh, refused and uh, you can see in the 1920s uh, uh, in many european countries you know a big part of the elite accepting uh, starting to accept uh, yeah. uh, fiscal changes and social changes, yeah. which in 1914 were impossible, and in between, yeah. you know, the Bolshevik Revolution and, and has, has completely uh, uh, changed the view of what. Uh, you know, we should accept or not, yeah. because people realize that, after all, you know, progressive taxation is less uh, dangerous than straight uh, expropriation, and so this, uh, you know, the entire history of inequality is made of uh, struggles and, and revolutions and, and play a role. Labor unions play play a very large role. So it's now today, you know, with the decline of manufacturing and employment, and it's clear that uh, labor unions, you know, in recent decades did not play the role uh, in wage bargaining uh, in, in a number of countries, in particular in Europe, that they used to play uh, up until the 70s or even 80s. And, and probably that's the reason why, uh, uh, you know, some countries that, used didn't, that didn't have a national minimum wages until recently actually developed national minimum <coughs> wages like uh, Germany or Britain. Uh, but now I don't think that's going to be uh, enough. You know, I think uh, we still need... Uh, you know, collective uh, bargaining institutions and, and, you know, just national legislation is not going, is never going to replace this. Yeah. Heather, um. I'm glad that you, that, that was, that was good to hear. That's great. <laughs> I, well, I think actually I will just make one note. I mean, I think that was, that was great to hear, but I think that, you know, one of the things when we talk about inequality, I'm often just amazed at how the conversation um, is about um, poor, or maybe yeah. folks at the very, very top. And I mean, really, when you look at what's happened in the United States, I mean, the, the numbers that you and Sai has put together, where you look at the top 1%, that is critically important. But understanding how um, that has been associated with a, uh, a squeezing of the middle and, you know, sort of people being pushed out mostly to the bottom, a few to the top, um, is, is really a big piece of the story and it both affects the politics but it also affects the economics, I think, in, in very uh, important ways. So I think, you know, unions, I mean, minimum wages are great but that's way down here. Unions really were about folks in the middle and making sure that you had all the things that you uh, that they did in terms of wages, but also on the job productivity. Okay. Um, Anwar, here's your chance to talk more about conflict. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but I actually want to talk about another uh, element, which I think is, um, I have been working for 15 years on a book, which I just finished, and the central theme of that book is that um, capitalism is driven by profitability most of all. Businesses depend on profitability, and that profitability provides wages and uh, rents and interests and all that. So it's very important to focus on that. And what's the relevance of that? Insofar as we're talking about policies, uh, talking about benefiting people as a whole, we have to recognize that this may have limits insofar as it has a negative impact on profitability. So it's not just the individual people like the Koch brothers or, you know, maybe our uh, opposition candidate for this kind of discourse, but really about the fact that in capitalist economy runs on profit. And so here's the punchline of that. Increasing wages is entirely possible, but if it's not going to have a negative impact, it must be attended to with increasing productivity. It's what I call the Swedish solution. And Swedes raise wages tremendously, but they also raise productivity. In a modern era, in the time of crisis, that's a different discussion, because you can't do both. But over the long run, I believe it's possible to show that this 
that, you, that the dynamic of the system is fundamentally constrained and shaped by the dynamic of capital, and capital dynamic it depends on profitability. So these, that's why I put so much emphasis on the wage share argument in, in my book also, because it's a very crucial issue. It determines the profit share, and the profit share right. with right. technical change determines the profit right. rate, and that drives the system. Um, now our final question, which John Kenneth Galbraith said that phrase gives hope to the audience. <laughs> Um, and this is, reflects the multi-generations here in the audience. Um, it doesn't happen that often. We have young students and old professors um, in the <coughs> audience. And this question is about something that you've also mentioned in your, in your book. Um, that is, it was almost a warning that with all this talk about inequality um, at various levels, there is a political economy narrative that threatens to supplant um, um, this conversation, and that's the narrative of intergenerational um, inequity, that the real problem is that the old are taking away from the young. Would you all like to comment on that narrative and that reality, if it's real? It's real, I hear. Is it real? Is that what's going on? Professor Piketty. Uh you know, I, I think the intra-generational inequality have always been and, and will always probably be more important than this intergenerational uh, conflict. You know, I think it's important to realize that the, uh, you know, when we talk about inequality of wealth, you know, it's almost as big within each age group than yeah. for the entire population as a whole. So, uh, you know, the, the, if you take the population as, as a whole in the U.S., the, the bottom 50 percent owns uh, like two percent of total wealth. The next 40 percent own 22 yeah. percent and the t top 10 own the rest, so the rest 75. Are, 70, yeah. Now, this is quite it's quite amazing. striking. Now, it's if you amazing. look within each age group, you know it will be not very different. You know, yes. the bottom 50 would have uh, maybe five percent. Right. If you if you look within the people who are okay. 50 year old, or within people who are 30 year old, and the the, the middle 40 yeah. would own maybe 25 or as much That's as so 30. Amazing. So it's a and and the top 10 would still own you know. Uh, 70 instead of 75 or 65 yeah. instead of 70. So, you know, it's a bit less concentrated, but basically the level of inequality is, remains the same. So it's, uh, you know, it's very important to know because you have indeed this very ideological discourse about how uh, life cycle wealth accumulation has entirely replaced, uh, uh, you know, dynastic wealth inequality and inequality within each generation. But in fact, it's, it's not the case. You know, this is a fairy tale. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this idea that uh, the now you know everybody is poor and then rich as as you get older and then poor again when you die because you have eat up, eaten up your wealth uh, to during your pension. You know, that's a theoretical model. But if you look at the data, you know, that's uh, really a, a limited part of what wealth distribution and accumulation is yeah. is all about. Um, Heather and Anwar. So. Um, so one thing that we see when we look at the U.S. data in terms of uh, generational change is that proceeding, uh, as we move across cohorts, you see actually that the absolute level of income and wealth has been falling for for, for generations. So the Gen X first, and then the millennials behind them, and the Gen Y, the Gen Y, and then the millennials, and then the, you know behind them are all seeing lower uh, starting salaries and mm -hmm. greater levels of debt in general, um, and. When you think about that, I mean, I think that is very worrying. I mean, so so I think your point in terms of the relative may be true, but my understanding of the absolute is that it's it's down, but it certainly is also increased in terms of the debt loads, which is something that we've been talking a lot about in terms of, uh, especially student debt, um, uh, in in Washington over the past couple of years. Um, I think that the. The, the, one of the things that when you look out at the, the way that we support families, we have a set of social policies that were, for the most part in the U.S. case, um, designed for the way that families looked in a traditional sense in the 1930s. We've had some adjustments over time, but for the most part, the infrastructure that we have that supports families and that provides our basic labor standards is still ensconced in the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Social Security Act, wonderful people pieces of legislation, but when families looked very differently than they do today, 
And when I say families look very differently, primarily what I'm talking about is the way that people are raising the next generation. So you're talking about young families. So anytime you're thinking about the changes in how households are looking, you're, you are essentially talking about changes across generations. So when you look today at families um, with children in the home, you know, it used to be in the 1960s, of course, you had, you know, a stay-at-home mom and a dad, and that, that was about 60% of families. And today, if you were to, you know, sort of map that out, you see a wide array of different kinds of families, families with different work patterns, with different numbers of parents, more kids living with grandparents, and all sorts of crazy things, and we don't have a policy infrastructure that supports it. <clears throat> I say all this in a very long-winded way to say that when you're thinking about the intergenerational conflict, families are getting very little from their government when they are younger. Um, they have very expensive schools, they're not getting support when they have children, when they're sort of they're at the low end of their earning. They are looking at jobs that are with unpredictable schedules. They don't get jobs and keep them. They don't have pensions. The whole world has shifted for them, and I think we have that we are not having the conversations that we need to have to actually address any of those realities. And then we wonder why young people say that they don't think that government works for them. And I think we need to, I mean, I would encourage it. So I don't think that it is necessarily a generational battle, but I do think that the way that inequality is played out and the mm -hmm. lack of attention to that um, does mean that there have been generational impacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would point to something that we haven't mentioned yet, which is actually in Thomas's book, which is the tremendous drop in the population growth rate. He yeah. mentioned that in passing. There's a wonderful graph. You know, you see it going down, heading towards zero. Well, that will naturally shift the balance between young people and old people, especially given that medicine allows us old people, hopefully, to live longer. Um, but yet the, the paradox is, in the modern world, is that despite the fact that the population of young people is growing more slowly, the unemployment among young people has grown dramatically. And that is not a natural consequence, it's a consequence of the crisis and also the fact that mechanization has actually accelerated rather than slowed down, despite the fact that workers are cheaper, because globalization has also spread mechanization all across the globe. Again, I believe that these are sort of intrinsic native properties in the same sense that that Thomas believes in inequality tendency is a native property, but I don't mean by that that they're ineluctable. Mm -hmm. In the same sense that Thomas says, these are properties that can be offset, but they require attention and focus, and they require, to come back to Teresa's question, conflict. Yes. Thank you very much for the conversation. <laughs> Thank you for coming.